Oi. Warren Mosler, it's very good to have you here at our studios in uh, Real Vision. We've been trying to talk to you about uh, MMT for a very long time. I think we're going to end up calling you the godfather of MMT for this particular video. And uh, I want to start with, because uh, uh, MMT is a really hot topic now, and, uh, and you were the progenitor of, of MMT. Are you very excited about the fact that it's been getting a lot of press, or do you think that it's been misrepresented in the press and that's giving you a difficult time? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I'm very pleased that it's gotten there at all. And yes, it gets misrepresented around the edges, and, and that's always going to happen. I can imagine Marx and Keynes feel much the same way about what's happened to what, what they've said. Uh, and that's, that's the way uh, things are. That's the way the world works. And, and, but we've got a lot of good uh, MMT proponents, they're called, people like uh, Stephanie Kelton, Randy Ray, and Pavlina uh, Chernova, Bill Mitchell, of course, and probably somebody else I should be naming, but who've been with me for over 25 years trying to uh, get the word out, doing the research, writing the papers, and uh, they're out there doing the best they can to keep the message on message. And uh, I'm just very pleased with the way it's been going. I was telling you before that I wanted to go full circle to where you were before MMT got about, because my understanding is, is, is that you were a money manager who was looking at uh, making money, doing trades, uh, investing, and MMT grew out of your desire to actually understand the mechanics of how the treasury market worked. Can you take us back to your trading days? Right, so probably uh, best to start at Bankers Trust in mm -hmm. 1976, primary dealer. I was, they brought me in from nowhere to be vice president of Ginnie Mae's sales and trading or something like that. Uh, that was, so, what was I, 27 years old. And being there on the money desk there, I was in the middle of all the discussions. The economists were in there, Alan Lerner, Alan Rogers was a trading manager, Jay Pomerantz was my mentor, he had brought me in, the, the Ginny Mate trader, and it was the beginning of derivatives, it was the beginning, uh, we were the first to start making markets, forward markets, mm -hmm. and uh, we we're Fed watchers, everybody was a Fed watcher, and you watch what they did. I remember coming in every morning and, and looking to see how many bonds the Bank of England bought. And it was, oh, what if the Bank of England doesn't buy the debt, what's ever going to happen to the United States? <laughs> and then it moved on to, I don't know, Japan and the Saudis, and now it's... China, whatever. And of course, it's never made any difference. And I noticed that pretty quickly. And so you start thinking about why it would or would not matter whether the, the Bank of England bought the debt or, or whether uh, the Fed came in to do repos. Well, what's that? What are they doing? They're buying securities. Well, why does that matter? What accounts are they debiting? What are they crediting? How does the, the, the uh, what, what's going on inside of monetary operations? So I've described myself as a longtime insider. Uh, of monetary operations themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's very revealing, those types of things. So I remember when they raised the um, reserve requirements back, it must have been 1977 or something, and a trading manager said, uh, well, I hope the Fed doesn't just give the banks the money because the money supply is too high and they need to bring it down. And I said, well, they have to because if they don't, you know, in the first instance, it's going to be an overdraft if your reserve requirement's raised. I don't know how I knew that. And then uh, my uh, Cliff Finer, who became my partner later, uh, called. He was at um, Phoenix Mutual, and there was an article by uh, Eric Heinemann and Morgan Stanley saying the same thing. Um, you know, the Fed should, should give the banks the money this time. We should let the money supply go down. And I explained it to Cliff, and he called them back, and they gave him some double talk. And we discussed that, and he called them back, and he calls me. He says, they withdrew their statement. <laughs> they agree that the Fed will add to reserves. Okay, and so... There was no name for that back then, except just understanding monetary operations. And it was, I was isolated at the time with that opinion. It was the mm -hmm. entire trading desk. I'd been there a year. Everybody else kind of dismissed it. And so uh, it's just the basic understanding of the logic behind the currency uh, was something I was interested in very early. So, you know, uh, how did the whole MMT, the, the uh, theory, uh, come about? Like, what, how did it start out? Was it something that came from you, or it, is it uh, economists, dead economists, or what happened? You know, I have a BA in economics from the University of Connecticut, but I started um, in engineering. I was mm -hmm. there for two years. Had a 1-8 average. I realized I needed to ch change course now, or else... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> I wasn't going to make it. So I switched economics, which was a whole lot easier for me. And I got out of there with a 2.5 average. Uh, so I'd never been a, a student of economics. I'd never read Keynes. I read his quotes. I'd, I didn't know anything about the history of thought. Mm-hmm. So all I knew were monetary operations as I got started. And, I, and, um, and it grew over time. So the uh, came together um, in the early 90s when Italian bonds were yielding, I'll say, 12% right. for a given uh-huh. maturity, maybe a two-year. And you could borrow, and they were denominated in lira, and maybe it was 93, well, 92, 93. And you could borrow lira to pay for them from the banking system over there at 10%. So there was a you know, 200 basis point spread just for doing nothing. And the profit would be in lira. So whether the currency went up or down didn't matter much. It would just affect the size of your profit. You didn't have to put up any capital. But no one would do it because they were all concerned that Italy was going to default. And so uh, if you could come up with a reason they weren't going to default, uh, there was a lot of money in that trade. And right. so that's how we first started looking at that market. And I remember talking to uh, Tom Schulke, my research uh, guy there, and it just dawned on me, Tom, if the Fed sells us securities or the Treasury sells us securities, it doesn't matter to us. We own the same thing. The money all goes to the same place. Yet they say one is for financing expenditures. The other is supporting rates. It's just a reserve drain. It's got to be the same thing. The difference has to, can only be accounting on their side of the ledger. It can't be any actual difference, and, which means, and then from that, it's obvious the whole thing is just a big reserve drain. The whole point of rates of Treasury securities is to support interest rates and not to finance expenditures. To, to help the uh, the central bank hit its uh, interest rate target. Right, right, right. Because if it doesn't sell securities, when the government spends, it adds reserve balances. And back then, they didn't pay interest on reserves. And so the, in, the you know, policy rate would be zero if they didn't somehow give the holders of those balances an alternative place to put them, an alternative interest-bearing account. Well, that was Treasury securities. So the Treasury would sell securities, and some of those funds would shift from reserve accounts to securities accounts and earn the interest rate. And then if there were any left over, the Fed would have to come in and, quote, mop them up. It was called offsetting operating factors, where they would sell securities in one form or another, either overnight or term. And then that would support rates. And so um, the whole point of these securities was to support interest rates and not to fund expenditures. Funding came simply from the Treasury instructing the Fed to credit an account. They just changed the number up. And you know, more recently, Bernanke, when he was asked where the money comes from, he said, we just used a computer to mark up the numbers in the accounts. But, that, but you know, everybody in monetary operations in the Fed knows that. That's what they've always done. So you know, that understanding is there comes out that they're spending first, okay, and then taxes get paid. They spend first, and then the funds are there for bonds to be purchased. And again, inside the Fed, they say, you, know, you can't do a reserve drain without doing a reserve ad. Otherwise, you get an overdraft, which is a reserve ad. And so just as a point of logic, uh, when you're the source of something, you spend first and then. So, yeah, tell me about that in terms of uh, being the source. I mean, how is it that I think this is one of the big questions that people have about the operations and about MMT. One of the basic things is how is it possible that the U.S. government could spend uh, first before it gets the money? Right. So that's like... uh, if you go to the movie theater or the mm-hmm. football stadium, like nobody thinks they collect the ticket first before they sell it. Okay, so it's, it's the same thing. When you're the source of the thing, all the dollars to pay taxes can only come from the federal government or its agents, or else they're called counterfeit. You can't do that. And so they, as a point of logic, necessarily have to spend first before they can collect, you know, or, or spend first before payments can be made back to them. And so uh, inside the Federal Reserve, it means you credit the account first and then you debit the account. Right. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's that simple. And the recognition at that time was also that the currency itself is a simple public monopoly that flows from that understanding. Uh, the, the Fed is the monopoly supplier of reserves. You know, everybody in Wall Street, oh, if they know that. That's why they have to vote on the interest rate. That's why there's no market for interest rate, because when you have a monopoly, you don't have a market. They supply the reserves. They're not going to earn interest unless they take some kind of action to see that those reserves can earn interest. And today it's interest on reserves and securities. Back then it was just securities. So basically, modern monetary theory, from your view, the way it started was you could have yeah. called it monetary operations. That's right. Right. And and so, it's, it's not like a political economic theory. It's really a description of yeah. how so, the system works. So, so once we understand this, 
part. I had a reason to think about it because of the Italian trade. Uh, now when I see, okay, uh, you know, government bonds, are more public debt's going to drive up interest rates. It's like, no, it's not, because you're spending first. It's sitting there. It's going to earn whatever the F- Fed's policy rate decides it's going to earn, nothing more than that. It has nothing to do with the process of setting rates. The F- Fed votes on rates. It's not market forces. Well, they're going to crowd out the borrowings taking money from somebody else. Not when you're adding it first, and then first you add it to a reserve account, and then you shift it to a securities account. That's not taking anything from anybody. It's adding it first. Once you're spending first, once you get the sequence right, all these other things that you hear uh, are obviously wrong. And so back then it was the Ross Perot phenomena and mm-hmm. there was this huge deficit you know, mania about what was the U.S. going to do, we we're going to go broke, and the whole thing. And we're looking at it like this is like nonsense. They've got the sequencing backwards. Well, what if we can't borrow? Why is that like any kind of imperative? You're spending first. If that person doesn't want to buy the securities, fine. They're just sitting with the reserves. That's not the government's right. problem. That's their problem. So once you understand monetary operations, what was going on in the political debate was just an absurdity. And so I wound up writing this paper called Soft Currency Economics, which mm-hmm. still stands. I mean, I don't think there's been a word refuted. It's a fairly short paper, you know, in, since 1993 or whenever I first uh, printed it, you know, self-published it. And every, all of modern monetary theory is there in this short uh, paper. And that's kind of the source of it. And that's how it became political, because it was pointing out the absurdity of the political debate, which was both sides. It wasn't just Republicans or just Democrats. It was both sides. One of the questions I have is, how did this help you in terms of your uh, money management, in terms of trading, and how can it help other people in terms of understanding? I mean, as an example, in terms of QE we talked about, uh, yeah. you know, wh- what did it do for you back in the 90s, and what yeah. could it have done for people over time in Japan, in yeah. the United States? Well, it certainly prevented, it eliminated the potential of a lot of losses, okay? A lot of people were getting short Japan. They used to call it the widowmaker trade, uh, based on the idea that they're going to default and the debt's unsustainable and it's going to cause interest rates to go up. And you know, we knew that was nonsense. And so we just stayed away from that and watched people lose a lot of money over the years on that trade. So in terms of the other way around, well, uh, you know, we wound up being the largest holder of Italian bonds outside of Italy ourselves and our clients. And that worked out well over the next couple of years as the spreads went away and narrowed. Mm-hmm. And we even went to Italy right before we put the trade on, met with a people at the finance ministry, Luigi Spaventa, and made sure they understood it, which they did after we discussed it. And so that gave us the further confidence to know they weren't going to push the wrong buttons or something right. like that, you know, once they, we were sure they understood their own monetary operations. And in fact, after we left, uh, within a week, I think an announcement came out, they said all payments would be met, no extraordinary measures would be taken. And so after that, the spread gradually went away. So it's, it was helpful in understanding the European situation where the European state um, nations turned themselves into what were U.S. states. And so we understood the, immediately the difference in the dynamics between what they were and what they'd become and the ramifications for the banking system, deposit insurance. Ex- explain that a little bit. Like, wh- what is the difference? Like, yeah. uh, you know, I, I have a pretty good understanding myself, but viewers might not. How is Europe, how are the European, what do you call it, the Eurozone? The member nations, yeah. Member nations different from, say, Australia or the U.S., for example. Right. So they, they were not different before when they had their own currencies. Mm-hmm. But when they got together and they created their new central bank, the European Central Bank, and their own central banks became branches of the European Central Bank, they were now in the position of U.S. states or Canadian territories, or somebody other than the issuer of the currency. They became users like you and I, where they, each member nation by law was required to have funds in their account before they could spend. Like you and I, they have to get the money first before they can spend it. They and there was no backstop from the monetary authority because that yeah, was- Yeah, that's right. right. Initially, they were supposed to be on their own and independent. And then we looked at the debt ratios and uh, people who are in that position, whether it's corporations, individuals, foreign countries borrowing in foreign currencies, right. you know, uh, or the U.S. states. Once you get up to 15% debt to GDP, you know, that's when California starts having trouble and can't fund themselves. Okay, so now you've got these European member nations turning themselves into U.S. states, so to speak. And they're waltzing in with debt ratios of anywhere from 60 to 130 or 40%, 50% of GDP. It's like, this is insane. This cannot work. It'll work fine on the way up. Right. But as soon as you hit your first crisis, and then on top of that, Deposit insurance was each country insured its own banks. 
So can you imagine California insuring Bank America and New York insuring Citibank, and then you have a banking crisis? You take the states down with it. They can't, they can't do that. Okay, they don't have the uh, capacity to do that. It's always got to be the uh, federal government that does the deposit insurance. So they didn't have that either. And so what we did was, uh, by understanding that, we, again, avoided a lot of the problems and, and also uh, saw opportunities to do things along mm -hmm. the way, credit default swaps, things like that. Right. that uh, that that understanding gave us, you know, promoted, you know, allowed us to do that. When I ran my fund from 1982 mm -hmm. to 1997, before I turned it over to my control over to Cliff and the other partners for 15 years, we, we didn't have a single losing trade the whole time. It was a zero duration, fixed income, market neutral fund. So the returns weren't extraordinarily high. We had about a six and a half percent alpha or something like that. So, it was, but it was, they were steady. And so our risk adjusted returns were, were, you know, better than anyone for that entire period of time. And it was, it was, a lot of it was avoiding mistakes that others made by understanding these types of things. Uh, uh, let's go back to that. Like you were at Bankers Trust, you were at William Blair. Yeah. It was, so what made you leave the uh, banking community and go out on your own to your next venture? So when I went to William Blair, it was pretty much going out on my own. I was at Bankers Trust, they were a client. I was talking to Buzz Newton there, who was head of the corporate bond department. He never did any of the, I was at sales, he never did any of the trades. But after, at some point after I'd been there a year, he says, what do you think about coming out to William Blair and doing what you're doing for us, start a fixed income arbitrage department? So I said, well, you know, I have a pretty good job. I was vice president of Bankers Trust on <laughs> Wall Street. He said, well, you know, we don't have a salary. We'll just give you a retail payout of 30% of the profits. Nice. And I might be exaggerating, but the story I tell is, you know, that was a Wednesday and I started on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been another week or so in there. And so that's what got me out there. And then after, uh, and that went very well. And then after a, uh, a year or two, a couple of years there, we realized there was a, the, the trades we were doing, were make, the positions we were putting on were making we're doing very well, and the markets were a lot larger, so we could do a lot more than William Blair only had seven million in capital when we went there. And so um, we started a fund called uh, Illinois Income Investors and raised an additional 10 million in capital. That was 1982. And then because it, uh, we were doing, um, and then AVM was 1983, which was a broker dealer. And William Blair was part of that. We were there at William Blair. And then we left and moved the company to Florida. And uh, a few years later, William Blair, uh, uh, took their investment back. And so then we, we were on our own after that. Right. So uh, during that time, that's exactly the same time that you were uh, moving into the uh, what you could call academic uh, economics. So tell me about, you, you were saying that, uh, you know, you had no academic economics except for your undergrad experience, but then you put out this paper, Soft Currency That economics. was 10 years later. Right, yeah, in 1993. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... How did how did the, how did this the, all of these guys you were talking about yeah. uh, appear onto the scene who were both mostly in the academic economy? So I was trying to talk it up with people I knew, and somebody mm -hmm. sent me to this organization in the city called um, Social Policy Thing, mm -hmm. and there and I was in my how old was I? Let's see, nineteen fifties. Uh, this is ninety three, so I was in my forties, and 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 these people were older, like as old as I am now, right? And they were discussing it, and uh, I wasn't getting very far, but one of them said, you know, I, I hear you, you know, I, I, what you're saying, I, you know, I agree with what you're saying, and he was an economist, I, I didn't remember his name. And uh, th there's an active group on the inter internet discussion group that are called Post-Keynesians, mm -hmm. and so you should look them up. So I went and looked them up and uh, started interacting online in this discussion group. And that's where I ran into Bill Mitchell, Randy Ray, Matt Forstetter, and that group. Well, it turns out later, the person who had, I had met, I met a guy at a conference. I'm telling the story, and he says, that was me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it was Bill Vickery, who later won a Nobel Prize. You know, wow. Uh, yeah, and he, he, so he turned out to have been the one who had sent me to that discussion group. So then I started working on those, that discussion group, and there are quite a few of them. And I... I made progress uh, with Bill Mitchell. I went down to Australia to see him to, mm -hmm. to try and make some progress. And He's an Australian economist. Australian, yeah. And then uh, Randy Ray, who was at Denver University there, and Matt Forstetter was at Gettysburg. He had a, a undergrad, uh, Pavlina Chernova, who needed a summer job, so she came down and wrote two papers in my 
you know, I worked with her to write two papers that summer in my office, and those are on my website. And there's still key MMT papers, one of them on monopoly pricing and how the price system works and where the price level comes about in our economy. Nobody else had any idea of where the price level was. But once you understand the currency is a monopoly, then monopolists set prices. Then now it's perfectly clear where the price level comes from continuously. And the other one was a history of thought paper. And, and then, um, so it was still a small group, four or five, half a dozen. And this was 96 or 97, but it grew, and the financial sector was growing faster than that. Our clients all understood it. Uh, and so our business was good because we had clients who would listen to us and you know they did very well for their investors. Uh, and um, so, so I'm up to about 2000 now, I guess. Right. Yeah, and so in 2000, that's when the euro was formed. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, actually earlier. So 1996, mm -hmm. the euro was pretty much formed. So we had a uh, put together a conference at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, in 1996, and we had a lot of people from the street, some central bankers there. Charles Goodhart was there, and that's where we outlined everything we thought would unfold with the euro if it went through as it was on paper at the time, which it did. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 19, maybe 98, they irrevocably locked a currency, which is the actual, which I call the start date, and then the actual euros came. And if you think about the concept of spending first, nobody can pay taxes until after the funds are out there. If you think about how the euro started, on what, on, you know, on, on the last day of the old currencies, you've got lira, marks, and pesetas, and then the next day everybody has euro. So how did that happen? Well, the European Central Bank bought the money supply, right? If you had a bank account with pesetas, the next day you had a bank account with euro. They bought it, took took yours. The, you know, the reason the currency has value is because it's the tax credit, the thing needed to pay taxes. And so the euro was now the new tax credit. They were all taxing in euro. And the old currencies were worth nothing, except for what the European Central Bank bought them for on day right. one. But after that, they're not worth anything because they're no longer needed to pay taxes. And so uh, there's a giant case of spending first before anybody could pay taxes or buy bonds, right? And so, uh, you know, so it was, it was, you know, it was interesting to be there at the time watching it all happen. It was certainly uh, uh, interesting times to live in, yeah. Uh, th that's when you start to get into the, the uh, political realm of things. I think yeah. that, you know, if you fast forward to today where yeah. uh, I think a lot of the ideas that you're talking about with regards to Europe, about uh, monetary uh, uh, monopoly of the central bank, are accepted, then comes the ideas on top of the monetary operations ideas. And I think this is where we get into the MMT of today and where a lot of the debate comes in is, is okay, so you're describing the operations. What about policy issues? Yeah. So with the, with the European situation, so, you know, we foresaw back at the end of in the 90s that at some point the... Um, European Central Bank would have to guarantee the member nations. Mm -hmm. Right. And, yeah. that, and that happened in 2012 when Mario Draghi said, we'll do what it takes to prevent default. And that also helped with the banking crisis because now the deposit insurance was more credible because at least it came from governments that were guaranteed by the central bank. One of the things that happened that we didn't see happening is that the central bank at the same time took control over fiscal policy. Right, okay? yeah. Because now they had this guarantee that they could use as a threat. If you don't behave, we're gonna remove the guarantee. And so when Greece was threatening not to behave, they could remove the guarantee and the Greek spreads would go out, Greek rates would go up and they couldn't fund themselves. Italy, earlier this year, there was just some rumblings of not obeying the rules for deficit rules right. and all of a sudden their spreads go out because now the markets are worried the central bank's gonna pull the guarantee. So they've used that as, you know, lever to enforce it. It was never meant to do that. They had other ways to do it, but no one else at the uh, finance ministers or probably nobody's complained. So I guess they're happy to have the ECB <laughs> being the disciplinarian. But uh, and, and the next thing we saw that happening after that is there was going that monetary policy would not work, which we've been saying for a long time. The lowering rates. I remember in 2012, uh, I was speaking at Rimini in a and they asked what would happen with the do what it takes. I said, well, Italian rates are going to come down, but the economy is going to get worse right. because Italy's going to be paying less interest to the economy, you're removing income. It's not going to, it's not going to improve. Yeah, talk to me about that. Yeah, that, that's an interesting concept. So we know that the government pays interest on their uh, debt, and you know m most of it goes to the private sector, right. and so the private sector is a net receiver of interest. Right. So 
most people think when you lower interest rates that it spurs uh, the economy, but you're actually robbing people of interest income at yeah, the same time. You're, you're, yeah, I call it uh, basic income for people who already have money. <laughs> 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 so I've heard basic income proposals, but I've never heard anyone propose it, right or left, that we should do that for people who already have money. But that's what you're doing. You raise rates, you're paying out more net payments from government to people who already have money. And uh, it's always been presumed, well, you do it to prevent inflation or to slow the economy down. But my experience, with the way I've read the data, is I've never seen it that way. I've always seen it the opposite way. Raising rates has supported inflation. It's caused it to be prolonged. It's caused growth to be stronger and prolonged. And it's always something else that's caused the end to the cycle, even though it's coincident with rates going up because the Fed is doing it in response to other things. But I don't see that as the causation. So, so what about the negative interest so, rates then? Yeah, so positive interest rates are a payment. Negative interest rates are a tax. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've seen, was it Elizabeth Warren who proposed a wealth tax? The, the more um, subtle way to do that would have been to propose negative interest rates. Right. Because if rates are minus 1%, you've got $100 in the bank. A year later, you've got 99 If you've got $100 in the bank and there's a 1% wealth tax, a year later, you have 99 It's the same thing. All right? But when you say negative rates, it's not like, oh, you're taking money from people and taxing them. You're actually trying to help the economy. Right. You know, so. Well, you know, the reason you get into this bind is, is because basically what uh, the, the, the political ideology is that you can't have fiscal po active, active as fiscal policy. You can't have an active fiscal policy. You need yeah. the monetary authority to right. raise rates up and down with the cycle because that's how you're going to yeah. get things to happen. Right. So that's where you get into policy issues yeah. right there. And I agree, but the, the problem is the monetary authority is, and I, the analogy I'm using, it's like the child in the car seat with the steering wheel. He's not driving the car. He, everybody thinks he's driving the car, and the car's moving and he's turning, and two or three years later the economy turns and they say, oh, there's a lag or something. But it, it's always moving because of the automatic sta fiscal stabilizers or some other event that I've seen. It's never been the... The, the driving by the central bank. So they, they've never been in control. And it's always been the automatic fiscal stabilizers or the Obama stimulus or the, or the uh, Trump tax cut or something like that that's, that's been the mover behind these things. Or changes in private sector lending. You might have changes in uh, down payments on homes or, or the ability of some new kind of derivative to fund oil exploration or something like that. So it's always been deficit spending, either public or private. And I, it's probably... A lot of it's private sector, which uh, unfortunately turns out to be pro-cyclical, right? Mm. It goes up on right. the way up and it crashes. Right. That's why we get to boom bust because of the pro-cyclical uh, private sector. But it's it's a fact. It's a major factor, is what I'm saying, and not so much the Fed. So you know, I can remember maybe in the '80s or something, I was on the phone to somebody from uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. I say, uh, "How's the uh, how's the mortgage market?" And um, he said, "Well, it's." It's pretty good right now, he said, but you know, mortgage rates are 17.5%, but I think if they put them up to 18, it's going to kill it. I go, okay, thank you. Then I talked to somebody in Japan. How's the, how's the mortgage market? How's housing doing? He goes, well, it's pretty weak right now. Rates are 3.5, but I think if they put them down to 3, it's going to get it going again. <laughs> so I'm thinking, like, how important are the rates? And if you look now, we've got, oh, you know, rates just went up, so mortgages went from 4 to 4.5, so the housing market slowed down. Look at the last cycle. Where were mortgages when we had... Over two million housing starts. Where now we have half that. Right. right? Yeah. Okay. So they were what seven percent. Okay. And, and where were they in the late seventies? They were fifteen percent. And we had more housing starts than we have today, and we had half like half as many people. Okay. So on per capita basis, we've had our strongest housing starts with high more because it's always something else. So looking at that, I'm not saying it won't matter for the next week or two weeks. You'll have people accelerating. Uh, they're borrowing, you know, they're going to rush in and try and get a mortgage now instead of next month because rates are down or something like that. So you're going to get some noise short term and you'll have traders moving portfolios back and forth short term. But over time, on a look back, you know, 30 rate, years of zero rates in Japan and it's and they say we just need a little more time. Okay. Mar Mario Draghi with, you know, six or eight years of zero rates and now negative rates and we just need a little more time. It, it's, they can't be working or else right. they wouldn't be negative now. <laughs> well, tell me about what's the what's the outcome then for let's so, uh, so for monetary, Europe. So I say monetary policy doesn't work. Right. So now Europe's going into recession if the charts keep going the way they're going. Uh -huh. I just saw one of the charts today going straight down, and right at the bottom there's this little leg sideways, and they say, "Oh, it's improving." <laughs> it's like, okay, we've had a global collapse 
because of tariff man, you know, I call Agent Orange when it comes to trade, <laughs> uh, just throwing a monkey wrench into the whole global supply line thing. And so, and it's at a tax, right? $70 billion a year tax. It's not huge, but it's a substantial tax. And it's all very high multiple taxes on people right there at the consumer level. And all the charts are going down, okay? And so now what's Europe gonna do if they, and, and, and unemployment today went up in Germany for the first time. And it went up a lot, like 60,000. And it could just be a blip. It's only one, you can't go by one number. But, but what are they gonna do? They know interest rates. They know monetary policy doesn't work. They can't use fiscal policy. They have laws against it. They right. just were badgering Italy yesterday about you don't dare to exceed your, you've got to pay down your debt. I mean, <laughs> reduce your debt during a recession. And so um, what's the open channel? Well, the only open channel is new bonds at the euro level, mm -hmm. deficit spending at the European level which will be the European Investment Bank or some other agency or something, and get the deficit spending from there. And they're gonna need 500 million, uh, billion euro, maybe 600 billion euro, maybe 5% of GDP annually to fill the hole in the... Uh, but that's only, because yeah. we started on this with Italy. I yeah. mean, because I can't see that that would happen per se, yeah. unless Italy or a country like that's on the brink. I mean, yeah. right now, Germany. they're an autopilot. Germany has the laws against, uh, you know, deficit spending. Right, but, but not at the European Union level. They can mm -hmm. do investment bonds and distribute them on a per capita basis or something like that to all the member nations. So, And you think that could happen before we have a, another crisis in Europe? Well, no, it'll happen sometime after. Mm -hmm. But I think that'll be the response to the crisis because I don't see any other response. You don't think that perhaps Europe would break up, that the euro would actually collapse entirely because yeah. of this nationalism that's taking over in Europe right now? Yeah, I think that will happen if they don't come up with this. And so you've heard the noises getting louder for euro bonds. First it was the Juncker bonds a few years ago and that never went anywhere. And then more recently, uh, you know, Varoufakis with Greece said we need national investment policies. And then uh, a couple of the Italian the league, I think, is proposing you know national investment policies, and so they're all looking towards investment, and everybody's infrastructure is crumbling over there, and so uh, the noises are getting louder, and they take and that's how it works over there, and then eventually it comes out it, because then it's an old idea, and they've been looking at it, and uh, and look, nobody ever thought uh, the European Central Bank would guarantee all the member right. nation debt, but they did because that was there was no other choice, okay, and that's what's happening here. They're going to have no other choice than these the massive investment bonds. That's, that's my forecast, okay? I could be wrong, but it's either that or the, like you said, it, it, it all falls apart. Going to the U.S. then, um, in terms of the political debate, and especially where MMT is involved in the political debate, Yeah. let's look at uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez yeah. uh, and the Green New Deal. Now, a lot of people are saying that is the epitome of MMT, but you were just telling me that MMT is about operations, monetary yeah. operations. How do you make the jump from, this is the monetary operations that MMT says, and this is a, a policy that we would recommend given the constraints imposed by Yeah, so when somebody situation. says to me, how do we pay for the Green New Deal? I say, well, Congress appropriates the money, and then uh, the Treasury instructs the Fed to credit the appropriate accounts, and that's how it's paid for. And then the Green New Deal people go, yeah, that. <laughs> okay. And so, and there's no disputing that. You can ask anybody in the Fed, yeah, that's how it works. That's how we pay for things. We change the number in the account. Who, you know, who else said, well, Bernanke said that. We have the quote. Greenspan said that. We have these quotes from Fed chairman. That's how it works. Go on in the center, Fed and look at it. Okay, so now, what, if you, so now you've asked somebody how you're going to pay for it, and they give you that answer. Now what do you say? I mean, you're the interviewer. It's like, okay. You say, well, is that going to, uh, isn't that like Zimbabwe or something like that? You know? And so well, that's how everything's been paid for. The Treasury has been instructing the Fed to credit accounts you know, for the last 200 years or since 1913 or whatever, since we've had a Federal Reserve. And it hasn't created Zimbabwe yet. And if you want to know why, we can explain that to you. But just doing that is not what creates Venezuela or Zimbabwe right. or Weimar. You know, it's it's something else, okay? And so, what is so it that, something so, else? So, well, so that's anyway. So that's why MMT has the answer to their uh -huh. question of how are you going to pay for it? Right. Nobody's had that answer before. 
So, you, you know, I have two questions on that. Okay. Uh, obviously, I, I was already saying, what is that something else? But I understand. I mean, I, you know, when I was yeah. doing a little research about some of the things that you've said, we can talk about this thing called the uh, public purpose. Yeah. My understanding is, is you say there's no reason that we should have unemployed people yeah. crumbling infrastructure when we're the richest country in the world. Right, right. Uh, that's just ridiculous. And and we can we can pay for that right with you know keystrokes essentially. So now you have to go back to the money story. Mm -hmm. We start the money story differently than um, other schools of thought. They all start with people doing bartering or using seashells or something. And we're not saying that's wrong, but this, the money story for the modern state begins with a state that wants to provision itself. Mm -hmm. You've got a country that wants infrastructure. They want military to defend themselves. They want a legal system. They want public education or public health, whatever they feel is you know appropriate collective action should be taken. And there's some political consensus that agrees that that's what they'd like to have happen. Well, how do you do that? You just ask for volunteers out of the private sector, it doesn't work, okay? So you need some coercive measure, way to provision the state. And so the way we do it is we begin with a tax liability. We don't begin with the state collecting money and spending it because there isn't any. We start with a tax liability that describes the currency. You've got, and let's say a real estate tax, just for simplicity on everybody's house, you've got to pay $100 a month. What's a dollar? You know, the dollar's the thing you need to pay your tax. Well, what is it? Oh, well, if you come to, you know, if you serve in the army, we'll pay you $30,000 a month or whatever. So the tax creates people looking for paid work in the government's currency which it couldn't otherwise, and, okay, and now because there are people looking for to earn that currency, the government can now spend its otherwise worthless currency, is how I say it, to provision itself. So you put a tax liability on, people show up looking for work because they don't want to lose their house at the macro level, and you hire them to be in the, in the army. Now you've got your military, you hire judges, you hire public health workers. And so you create the tax liability, and now you can hire people. So the tax liability, functions to create unemployment as we define it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we define unemployment as people looking for paid work. It's not about like people, unemployment is not people looking to volunteer for the American Heart Association. It's people looking for paid work in that currency. All right, so taxation, what we say, which nobody else has pointed out, not Marx or anybody else, but ta the cause of unemployment by design is taxation mm -hmm. for the further purpose of the government provisioning itself. Right. So a tax creates a certain number of unemployed. The economy needs the government's money for two reasons, both to pay the tax and if it wants to save anything, if it wants any equity, if it wants any net financial assets, if it has any use to have money in your pocket or money in the cash register or reserves uh, you know, against the future or anything else. If there's any savings desire, that's a reason to work for the money. So when the government spends a dollar, only one of two things can happen. It can be used to pay taxes or it can not be used to pay taxes and it remains as Savings, okay, so you create a tax liability, people show up for work, the American tax liability creates 10 million unemployed looking for work. Now the government only wants to hire 3 million of them. Well, it's made a mistake. Okay, you created, the tax liability was too strong, you created more unemployed than you want to hire. So what do you do about it? Right? So either you hire them if you've got some use for additional people, maybe you actually wanted more but you were afraid to because you thought you needed a balanced budget or something, or you lower the tax and they'll go away. And so it, it demands like a fiscal adjustment just to correct your mistake. If you lower the tax, the private sector will be able to have the demand and sales to hire those people away. Well, it's not quite that simple because once you've created unemployment, you've, those people from a private sector employment point of view are damaged goods. The private sector doesn't like to hire people who've been unemployed. Okay, well, we made a mistake. We hired seven million, we cost seven million people. Our tax was too large. We have seven million more unemployed than we wanted to hire. How do we get these people back into the private sector? So that's when I came, and this was 1993. Mm -hmm. um, what you do is you offer a job to anybody willing and able to work to promote the transition from unemployment, which is public sector. The tax has pulled them out of the private sector and caused them to be unemployed. Okay. and to promote the transition back into the private sector. And so people come to this job, they work, and now the private sector will hire them back because they know they take a bath every day and they don't get in fights and they have a supervisor and they're 
you know, yeah. have a good attitude or right. something. That's, the private sector doesn't need a lot. They'll train them if it's a good economy, but they want to at least know that you've got somebody serious about going to work every day. And it works. And there's lots of data of experiments that have shown this and it works. And so that's where the today's job guarantee comes in. And how critical is that to modern monetary theory? Well, like when, when we go yeah. from the operations to well, it's an important it's important because today we use unemployment as a buffer stock against inflation. Nehru, that's non-accelerating interest rate right. of unemployment. If it gets too low, you get unemployment because there's nobody for the private sector to hire. You know, so you drive up wages. If it gets too high, it's deflationary. So policy is actually aimed at maintaining a certain level of unemployment right. in order to not be inflationary. A buffer stock of unemployed right. people. Right. right. Well, the problem is if, the, if they're not liquid, if they can't be hired by the private sector because they're damaged goods, they're unemployed, it doesn't work as a break against inflation uh, when the economy picks up. You just get more and more unemployed or participation goes down or something with, with every cycle, and particularly in Europe, and you see that happening. But if they're employed, now they're much more liquid. Now they'll hire them right away because they're already working. And so they be, it's a much more effective buffer stock than unemployment. Okay, so what, what I say, which is now modern monetary theory, is that you always have a base case of analysis. Mm -hmm. How do you start your model? Okay, so we're using a buffer stock for um, price stability. Start with the buffer stock that makes the most sense from a liquidity point of view and negative externalities. You know, you and, and an employed buffer stock makes a whole lot more sense than unemployed. unemployed You've you got to have one or the other. Right. So we can start. I, I say the job guarantee is, is one of the um, assumptions in the base case for analysis. You start by saying tax liability, provisioning the government, we have a uh, job guarantee, so if we've taxes created more unemployment than we want, they can transition most efficiently back into the into the uh, private sector. Now, you can change the base case. You can say, you know what, I don't like the job guarantee for whatever reason, so let's change to unemployment. You can, okay, fine, you know. But the base case is this because if you use unemployment, you're going to have you should expect a lower degree of price stability more negative externalities, but maybe that's what you want. Maybe you're trying to create a mob of angry people so they, <laughs> something, I don't know. It's a, you know, who knows what politics is trying to create nowadays. <laughs> maybe you want people throwing rocks at each other. So we start with the base case. The base case is also a 0% interest rate, like Japan's had. And again, for all the reasons we spoke, it's not inflationary, the currency doesn't go down. We would have seen that after 30 years if all those sky is falling fears were actually real. And we, don't and you're not like providing basic income for people who already have money in your base case. Mm. Now you can start with the base case and you say, okay, now I want to rate. Now I've got a model now with zero rate policy, no government security, it's just leave reserves. You don't have to offer interest rate support if your interest rates at zero. And someone says, well, you know, I'd like to have a higher interest rate for whatever reason. I'm trying to create more inflation. I want to pay people with money, more money, with no supply side. So I'd like to see inflation. You say, fine, you can take this model and we increase rates and now we have to, well, how do you do that? Well, you can see you have to either pay interest on reserves or offer securities and now we're paying more income to people so you can do that. And or I don't want the job guarantee. I want to do this. Or I want to change the wage of the job guarantee. So what's, how does that numerator, and that's the numerator for the economy, right? As a monopolist, you set one price and let everything else um, reflect market value you know, along with the institutional structure. And so rather than using unemployment as the whatever compensation you're paying the unemployed as a numerator, use the wage from the job guarantee as, as a numerator. Makes infinite more sense. And, and so that's just a base case. Then you can show how changing that can, you can meet your inflation targets, whatever they are. Or you can make sure productivity, labor, uh, real compensation increases with productivity or whatever else, whatever other political decisions you've made. So yeah. let me see if I can get yeah. this straight. Basically, yeah. MMT is about the monetary operations. Yeah. But basic economics and understanding uh, how the system works says that certain actions are going to lead to certain outcomes. Yeah. And you can have a base case of, this is the base yeah. of... Let me quickly add to mm -hmm. that. If you, if you don't understand that the government spends first and then collects that it's a public monopoly, you can't have a job guarantee because the debt could go up and you might turn into Greece or something like that. Right. Okay, but if you've got to understand monetary operations first, and then these policy options become obvious, or they become viable. Right. Which they're not under the current paradigm of 
the government has to get money through taxes to be able to spend. Any congressman will tell you, we've got a tax to spend, and when we don't tax, we have to borrow from China and leave the debt to our children. Under that paradigm, these options I'm talking about are not vi viable. Yet, when you understand monetary operations, they're entirely viable. And in fact, they become the base case for analysis. I was re reading something from Martin Wolf, who was talking about uh, inflation and things like the Green New Deal. What if everyone and his brother comes in and says, you know, we want the Green New Deal, we want uh, the uh, New Deal for uh, pipelines of uh, li uh, liquefied natural gas, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't there come a point where all of that is inflationary and it spirals out of control? Yeah, well, not spiral out of control, because once you understand the currency is a monopoly, inflation, what we call inflation, is just a series of one-time events. Anytime you stop doing it, it stops. It's not like if you make one false step, you turn into Zimbabwe or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's one-time events. But yes, if you have a tax in place, a tax liability, and it creates this 10 million unemployed, and you try and hire 11 million, you're just going to drive, you're not going to get 11, you're only going to get 10. You're just going to keep driving up prices as you pay more and more. And the price level is a function of the prices paid by the government when it spends as a monopolist. And so if you're paying $50,000 a year and you get your 10 million people, and it won't be this clean cut. And, and now you try to hire more, and now you're paying 60000 and 70000 You're just not going to get any more. Okay, you're just creating inflation. You're just redefining your currency downward without changing the tax liability. Yeah, the, the, the model I like to use so people can understand the pricing and how it works is, uh, you know, my wife and I were in Pompeii a few years ago, mm -hmm. and the guide showed us the coins that they used. And he said what happened in Pompeii was a nice place to live because they would collect these coins uh, for tax, and then they would pay people to do public service, police and public safety and the aqueducts and all this sanitation. And I said, well, you know, what actually happened was you pay the people first, and then you collect the coins. He goes, no, 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 you collect tax, and then you pay the people. I said, well, where would the coins come from? He says, well, the government made them. <laughs> I said, well, how did anybody get the coins to pay the tax? And he goes, so they spent them first and then collected them? I said, well, how else can it work? And he grabs his head and he goes, no, no, no. And he walked away. He wouldn't talk to me anymore. <laughs> okay. So, but everybody in Pompeii knew how it worked. They put a tax on everybody's house. People would show up for work. They'd pay them these coins out of the coin, but they weren't valuable coins. And they'd get things done. Well, they found like 20,000 coins in the street. All right, well, how'd they get there? Okay, so the government must have spent more than it collected. Okay, that's what we call deficit spending. And, and because people were coming to earn the coins for two reasons. Number one, to pay the tax. And number two, they needed some to be out in the street. That's the net money supply in the economy. Okay, the coins in the street are the public debt. They're the net money supply in the economy. They're the equity that supports the entire credit structure. That's what, it's, that's what they're doing there. That's why people are coming to earn the equity they need to support their whole credit structure. Now, what was a coin worth? So let's say they decided to pay one coin a day for a police officer. But somebody else didn't want to be a police officer because it's too dangerous. And he'd rather just grow tomatoes because that's what he always did. And even though I know there were no tomatoes in Rome back then. But <laughs> <laughs> they came from South America. It's this story. So, um, so he wanted to grow his tomatoes and to make pizzas. And, so the, uh, and, the, and the police officer didn't want to get his hands dirty. So he'd go work extra, make enough coins so he could pay his taxes and buy his tomatoes. And maybe one coin was worth a day's work and those two, you know, the, the uh, double coincidence of wants or whatever the economists call it. And so it was like one coin would buy 10 tomatoes. They, it was kind of the market that day. And, but a coin is one day's labor as defined by the state. We'll pay one per day. And one day's labor translates into 10, to, 10 tomatoes through market forces. If the, if the state says, look, you know, we're going to pay two coins a day. Uh -huh. Well, now a coin will only buy five tomatoes, right? Okay, it's the monopolist setting price. And if the tax was 100 coins and they were paying one a day, they know they're going to get 100 days labor. If they pay two coins, they're only going to get 50 days labor. So just by paying more for the same tax liability, you get fewer people. You're just creating inflation. And so that's, that's the dynamic. And, and the nice thing is monopoly is the easy one. When you take microeconomics, the first day they teach you monopoly, it takes about 20 minutes. It, everybody gets it. And then because it's one guy, you know, there's no competition or anything. He sets a price. People need what he has. And then the next day they go on to oligopoly where there's three or four. And, and then that's a little harder. It takes a couple days. Then after that, they go on to competition. That takes the rest of your life. You know, <laughs> asymptotes and maths and all this stuff. And so uh, the good news about the currency is it's the easy one. It's just a simple monopoly. And so once you understand that, then, then the rest follows. Yeah. 
So Warren, you know, we, uh, uh, we have a good five or 10 minutes. I wanted to go into some of the things that you're doing in your uh, private life. I, I heard, you know, that you have a whole uh, race car thing. T tell me a little bit about that. Like you built I, the I race did, cars? I, I built cars that were uh -huh. uh, road cars, sports cars. But uh -huh. I did sell the company for scrap value in 2013. So I know how hard it is to make profit in car company. But uh, yeah, it's the top performance car in the world, and I think it still is. Uh, a couple of people had some uh, that they raced last year in the Spanish GT, and the car is 18 years old. And they won. The, they won the series, and they're still adding weight and putting a restrictor on the engine. So it was called the Mosler MT900. So I got, uh, I had a car disease. Okay, I'll, I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've, I think I've thrown it, but I'm not sure. And if you want to talk about suspension design or anything else, uh, then, uh, then you know. I mean, how did you get into that? How did you? I mean, like, I know. Uh, I, you know, as a kid, I would take apart lawnmowers and build motorbikes and things like that. I was just always interested in mechanical things like that. And, and then you got into. I understand that you created a ferry because yeah. uh, the waters were uh, really choppy, going from Saint Croix to another island, Saint Thomas, Saint, to Saint Thomas. Yeah. Tell me, uh, tell me about that because that's a similar kind of thing. Yes, and they, they had a ferry going. It made everybody sick, and then they crashed it. So we didn't have one for four or five years. And I had gotten. A, I had never had a boat till I moved down there. So mm -hmm. I'd gotten a boat at Catamaran, which I thought would be you know, do the trick. And, and it was a lot better than any of the monohull boats in terms of ride and whatnot, but it still wasn't. It was still a boat. It would still get people seasick. I just started thinking about the ride motions and recognize the parallels with a car where a long wheelbase rides better than a short wheelbase car. And a boat's a zero wheelbase. The whole thing gets lifted up and over kind of like a toboggan or skis as opposed to a bicycle, which will a longer wheelbase, which will step over bumps and things. So dawned on me what you needed on a boat is the equivalent of a long wheelbase, which is hulls way out front and then hulls way in the back and a big space in between. So when you went over a wave, the front would go up and down and then the whole boat would go over the wave. You'd wait and then the back would go over. And I built a, they wouldn't build it. They didn't think it would work. And so I, sounds familiar. And they built it. You know, <laughs> I had to build a prototype, a 23 foot one. And we went out and it still have it. It, worked, it works beautifully. And then the boat builders took it out and they suddenly understood what that it did work and so they went and built it and it's about 100 feet long and holds 56 people and it was built similar to how the cars were built with you know, carbon fiber and foam core so it weighs only 30,000 pounds for a 100 foot boat so it's great fuel efficiency and it's been going back and forth for two years now people like it it's got a reasonable return on equity i charge 60 dollars where the flights which is less than the other boats and the flights were because it doesn't burn any fuel and flights are $150 or something like that. So it's uh, it's been good. And it's been a, during the hurricanes, uh, Irma and Maria, it was the only communications between the, the three islands. Uh -huh. and all the other boats got knocked out and this thing's going back and forth. No other boat has been able to make that route for more than a year, that was the record. And this one's been going two years now and there's not a crack or a stress, any stress on the frame that anybody's been able to detect because like a car, if you have tires at either end, you're lifting them up at either end, you're not stressing the frame. Nobody ever breaks a frame on their car or their bicycle because you're lifting at either end. But you can break skis or toboggan where you're lifting the whole thing over the middle. Mm -hmm. the boats break in half all the time right. because they go over a wave. At one point, the wave's in the middle and the boat's trying to break itself in half. Well, this one only gets handled at the ends. The middle never gets wet, doesn't get touched. So occupying my time doing that type of thing. It's great. You know, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that you are an engineer at, at, at yeah. you know, like you yeah. going full circle to what we were talking about when you started. I mean, clearly you have the engineering mind and wow. you're taking it to boats, to cars, to economics. Financial engineering. Right. right. So we, you know, our firm, we did a lot of those uh, so-called derivatives in the 80s. Okay, that was, we were right in the middle of that. And uh, so, you know, that's just something that comes easy to me to understand how these types of things work. You know? Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us, and I hope that uh, we can talk again about these kinds of things, maybe uh, where you see the economy going going forward, but I, I think that viewers will really like uh, yeah. hearing from the godfather of MMT. Okay. <laughs> At your convenience, I'm available. Thanks, sir. Thank you.